Hello everyone. This video is about the superficial veins of the head and neck with its applied anatomy. I am Dr. Lakshmi Gayatri presenting this video. As in all other regions, the veins of the head and neck are divided into superficial veins and deep veins. The superficial veins drains the venous blood from the superficial part of the head and neck and are present beneath the skin and in the superficial fascia. They drain the blood into the deep veins which are present beneath the muscles. The deep veins are pterygoid plexus of veins, internal jugular vein and the subclavian vein. The topics to be discussed here are superficial veins of the scalp, the superficial veins of the face and superficial veins of the neck. Veins of the scalp the skin and the superficial muscles of the scalp are drained by five sets of veins which accompany the arteries. These veins are present in the dense subcutaneous tissue beneath the skin. The supratrochlear vein, the supraorbital vein and the superficial temporal vein drains the venous blood from the frontal part, the eyebrows, the upper eyelid, the parietal region and from the temporal region while the posterior auricular vein and the occipital vein drains the venous blood from the posterior part of the ear and in the occipital region. The deeper part of the scalp drains into the pterygoid venous plexus. Infection can reach the interior of the cranial cavity from the outside. The loose sub aponeurotic layer of the scalp contains the emissary veins which connects the superficial veins to the intracranial dural venous sinuses. Any infection outside the scalp can be easily spread through these emissary veins into the dural venous sinuses causing intracranial infection. Hence, this space that is the loose sub layer is also called as a dangerous area of the scalp. Coming to the next topic, the venous drainage of face having facial vein and retromandibular vein. We discuss these veins under the following topics. Origin, Course, Relations, communications, tributaries, drainage and its termination with clinical anatomy. Facial vein. Facial vein originates as the angular vein formed by the union of the scalp vein, supratrochlear and supraorbital vein near the medial angle of the eye. It courses downwards along the medial aspect of the face and once it reaches the anterior inferior angle of the masseter in the lower border of the mandible, it pierces the deep fascia and joins the anterior division of the retromandibular vein to form the common facial vein. Throughout its course, it is related posterior to the facial artery but placed in a superficial position. It communicates with the most important cavernous sinus through two roots through the angular vein and superior ophthalmic vein and through the deep facial vein and the pterygoid venous plexus. It also communicates with the frontal diploic vein through the supraorbital veins. After it forms the common facial vein, finally it drains into the internal jugular vein. Its tributaries are the veins which accompany the corresponding arteries, also submental, tonsillar, external petrosal and submandibular veins. Cavernous sinus thrombosis is a more dreadful condition which occurs due to the spread of infection from the dangerous area of the face. The facial vein, since it drains the dangerous area of the face and is also devoid of valves, it can easily spread the infection in a retrograde manner through its communications to the cavernous sinus. The retromandibular vein of the face is formed by the union of the superficial temporal vein and the maxillary vein. After its formation, the retromandibular vein runs posterior to the ramus of the mandible within the substance of the parotid gland. In the parotid gland, it lies superficial to the external carotid artery and deep to the facial nerve. After it emerges from the post inferior pole of the parotid gland, it divides into an anterior branch and a posterior branch. This anterior branch has already been mentioned. It joins with the facial vein to form the common facial vein which in turn drains into the internal jugular vein. While the posterior branch joins with the posterior auricular vein of the scalp and forms the external jugular vein. The external jugular vein runs inferiorly and superficially in the neck to empty into the subclavian vein. The last topic is the superficial veins of the neck which shows considerable variations in the neck. These veins are external jugular vein, anterior jugular vein, 
posterior external jugular vein. They drain the blood into the deep veins like internal jugular vein and the subclavian vein. Coming to the external jugular vein. It drains the superficial part of the scalp and the face. Its formation is by the union of the posterior division of the retromandibular vein with the posterior auricular vein as already mentioned. Its course is within the parotid gland below the angle of the mandible. It runs obliquely downwards superficial to the sternocleidomastoid under cover the platysma and on reaching the root of the neck in the supraclavicular triangle it pierces the deep fascia and drains into the subclavian vein. The vein has a dilatation about 4 cm above its termination called sinus and during its course it has two pairs of valves. Talking about its relation, it lies superficial to the sternocleidomastoid under cover the platysma. The greater auricular vein passes lateral to the vein and the transverse cervical cutaneous nerve passes deep to the vein. The formative tributaries are posterior auricular vein and posterior division of the retromandibular vein. Other tributaries are posterior external jugular vein. Near its termination, it receives the transverse cervical vein, suprascapular vein and the anterior jugular vein. Through the oblique vein, it communicates with the internal jugular vein. When external jugular vein is severe, the most drastic complication of air embolism with hemorrhage may occur because of the suction of the air due to negative intrathoracic pressure. It occurs because the vessel wouldn't contract easily because of its adherence to the deep fascia. This condition is a medical emergency and an immediate finger pressure to occlude the wound becomes necessary for this. External jugular vein is a useful venous manometer. When the vein is engorged, we can suspect conditions like right heart failure or obstruction to superior vena cava due to any neoplasm or, an, or any raised intrathoracic pressure. A word about the posterior external jugular vein which is the tributary to the external jugular vein. It begins in the occipital region of the scalp and joins the external jugular vein in its middle part posteriorly. It drains the skin and the superficial muscles that lie posterior superior to the neck. Finally, talking about the anterior jugular vein, it originates from the confluence of the superficial submandibular veins near the hyoid bone. It courses downwards on the lateral aspect of the anterior median line. On reaching the clavicle, it turns laterally, undercover the sternocleidomastoid muscle. It pierces the deep fascia to join the external jugular vein. Sometimes it may directly end into the subclav subclavian vein also. In the suprasternal space, it communicates with the fellow of the opposite side by a transverse branch called as jugular venous arch. Sometimes there is a variation in which both the anterior jugular veins are united to form a single trunk called as median cervical vein. It receives the inferior thyroid veins as the tributaries. During its course, it drains the submandibular region and the midline structures of the neck. Finally, to end with the surface marking of the external jugular vein, a point below the angle of the mandible and a point above the midpoint of clavicle joining these two points gives the surface marking of external jugular vein. Question session. Thank you all.